All right, welcome to Journey Church. It's great to be with you this weekend. Uh, my name is Jim Wilkes. I'm the lead pastor uh, of Journey, and I want to welcome everybody that's watching online and watching through our broadcast safely and secure at home, bundled up, all warm, probably drinking your coffee and your mochas. Maybe you made breakfast for the whole family and you gathered everybody around to continue our series, Win 19. Hey, before we jump into the message, let me share with you two things. Number one, I am still in awe of what God did at Code Red last Wednesday. Come on, somebody. It was powerful. Now, listen, if you missed it, it's okay. Uh, you can join us for the next one. Pastor John Siebling will be with us at our Avon campus. We'll be broadcasting at Fairview Park and Twinsburg. Even the broadcast sites, God showed up powerfully, 7 p.m. this up-and-coming Wednesday. Second thing, uh, many of you are joining from the comfort of your home, and at the end of our time together, we'll be receiving our tithe and our offering, uh, and you can give safely and securely uh, on our app. You can go to journey.church and give. I want to thank you for your generosity, even though you're not at a particular campus right now, but you're at home. Uh, thank you for your generosity. Right now, about over 70% of our church have joined the online giving team at Generosity Rockstars. Thank you so much for your generosity. It continues to allow us to do ministry uh, at a high level and keep overhead low. Uh, again, you can give safely and securely at home through our website or through the app. Uh, we've been in a series called Win 2019 or Win 19, looking at how we can win this year. How many want to win? This guy right here. I want to make the biggest impact on this side of eternity in my uh, role as a husband, as a father, as a pastor. I want to crush it. Amen? Now, if you missed the past two weeks, uh, please go to our website, check out week number one and week number two. We kind of stack upon each other in these series. Week one, we talked about this. We talked about knowing God. How do we know God? Through this popular word uh, that we like to avoid called repentance. Uh, we challenge you to live a, a daily discipline of having an attitude of repentance. It means to turn to God 180 degrees. It's the Greek word metanoia. It's a military term to about face. That's what happens when we come to Christ and obtain salvation. We repent and turn to him. But even as believers, you can know God on a deeper level when he kind of reveals some things in your life that maybe are competitors to your relationship. We should repent, and in that place, uh, we'll know God at a deeper level. Then week two, we talked about this word, this right here, is the next move to make uh, to win in, in 19 is to discover purpose. God has a plan for you, for your friends, for your family members. He's got a plan to prosper you and give you a hope. But here's my, here's my challenge and also a concern I have. Most people in the local church don't know how God wired them. So our job as a church is to help you discover your purpose. The way that we do that at Journey is through a gathering called Connect. Uh, we had 208 people sign up for Connect last weekend. Come on, that's the way to be. Uh, you can still sign up for Connect on our website to discover purpose. Today, we're going to step number three, the next move, if you will, to win in 19 is to find freedom. If you're gathered around the computer screen or television, I want you to say this to all those around you, find freedom. Give them the command. It's time to find freedom in 19. It is step three. So I want to start here. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. It says this, for freedom Christ. There's that word. For freedom Christ has set us free. 
God came, Jesus came upon this earth, died upon a cross, rose again. So not only would you obtain salvation and eternity and heaven with, and be eternity in heaven with Christ, but to obtain freedom. Stand there firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery here. Now let me give you the context of what we're reading. Uh, Paul is writing to the Galatians, and he's talking to a specific group of people. Uh, They were being deceived into believing that they had to earn God's love and his grace, that if they did good, then God loved them more, and if they did well, then they would have obtained more freedom, but if they weren't doing too good, God loved them less. This group of people who were being shamed because they weren't following these rules set forth by the uh, super religious order of the day. And they had shame upon their life. They were falling back into religion. Religion puts you in bondage, but relationship in Christ brings freedom. We want you to find freedom in this message. What is freedom? By definition, freedom, uh, the word freedom actually means unrestrained. Isn't that powerful? to be unrestrained. Unrestrained freedom comes from understanding and knowing the identity that you have in Christ and who God's called you to be and how he wants to bless you. Unrestrained freedom comes from walking in your God-giving authority instead of being enslaved from your own selfish desires, your destructive life cycles, and your own personal preferences here unrestrained freedom Christ has set us free Paul says this to them he says listen here's what I want you to do listen to me here pay attention to what I'm saying here he's saying listen he says to them stand firm stand firm look at the person around you and tell them stand firm you might want to fist pump the people in your family and tell them stand firm here's what Paul was saying to them he's saying listen There are going to be people that want to put you in bondage, but listen to me, stand firm and don't do it. Don't go back into bondage where God has set you free. You know, I love freedom. I'm passionate about freedom. Why? Because there was a time I was not free. I wasn't free in my thoughts. I wasn't free in my emotions. I had some some baggage I was carrying. Even some of my behaviors weren't too good and too holy. And as God revealed them, Christ brought freedom to me, so I'm passionate about it, and I don't want to go back to stinking thinking. I want to stay free in my mind, amen? My wife Jennifer, Pastor Jennifer, champions our freedom ministry. We offer it many times throughout the year. When you hear about it, you need to sign up right away because it fills up fast, and only so many people can take it at a time. It's about a six-week Six week a class, one day a week, will teach how to unpack your bags and, and how to deal with ungodly beliefs and how to uh, undo those things that you've gone back into bondage about and helps you uh, unpack the bags that you've packed in your life. I love freedom. I want you to first turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. We're going to talk about a story involving uh, the prophet Elijah. It's the first time that we hear about Elijah in this story. Elijah lived during the reign of King Ahab. Now, Ahab, uh, just so you know, was a ruthless, one of the most vicious kings of the day. And God speaks to Elijah and tells him, I want you to go to him and give him a warning because he needs to stop what he's doing. Elijah rolls up and says in 1 Kings chapter 17, Now Elijah the Tishbite said to King Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now I bet some of y'all wish I came out today and said, Hey, there'll be no snow unless by my word. Y'all be uh, clearing and uh, clapping, right? But that's not what was said here. Let's go back to our story. He tells him, go to this mean king, this, this king who's vicious, and tell him it's not going to rain or even do until he changes his ways, right? Gets rid of, rid of some of these false prophets and uh, prophets of Baal and all these things. I mean, how would you like God to speak to you and tell you to go to someone who could actually end your life? But Elijah loved the Lord so much and knew his identity in God so much he went and did just that. After he gives him the word, it continues on. And the word of the Lord came to him, being Elijah, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, and he went and lived by the brook 
that is east of Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Verse 7, listen to this part right here. And after a while, the brook dried up. That's really important to understand, remember here, because there was no rain in the land. Anyone, have you ever experienced a time of which God did the miraculous on your behalf only for that one day to dry up without warning? Have you ever had something happen in your life? There was great provision, and eventually that provision ran out. Verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to him, being Elijah, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to feed you. I want you to stop for a minute and just listen to the progression of events. Elijah talked to this king. He's on the run for his life. He's hiding out by a brook. God provides through the brook and through these ravens. And God says it's time to move on. It's time to, where you're at right now, I want you to move to another place. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like when God is doing something so phenomenal in my life, and then it dries up and he says, hey, it's time to move. Why, why can't we just stay there? Why can't we just make a camp right here, pitch a tent, and stay there for a while, forever? It's good. And God was saying to Elijah, the way that he says to many of us, what I'm doing right now And when I want you to, I've got to take you from this place to the next place because I want what I want to do in your life. This old way of provision is not going to get you where you need to be. What got you here won't get you there. But it doesn't look like it at first when you look at the first glance. God says he's going to provide for Elijah by commanding a widow to feed him. Now, widows in this time within history here would tell us that most widows were not affluent or wealthy. Most were poor and needed their children to go out and work to provide for them. They needed assistance from the family. Verse 10, I want to read it to you here. So he went and went to Zarephath. When he came to the city gate, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water and a vessel that I might drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple sticks and I may go in, prepare for myself and my son that we might eat and die. This is not a good situation here, people. This is bad. But I want to draw a conclusion here. Isn't it crazy that God provides for you in the most unlikely places, that he might even lead you to a place that doesn't even look like a miracle can happen there. He says, I'm going to take you from this job to this job, and it's not a job promotion. It appears to be a job demotion. I want you to go to this person right here and ask for forgiveness, and when you do, they get mad at you and cuss you out. Have you ever had where God told you to leave one place, go to another place, and it looks like it's about to backfire on you? Verse 13, Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as I've said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, no, it will not run out. The jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and her, and, and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent nor did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. What a powerful miracle. It is fascinating of how God works. Many times, and listen to me, it might be worth writing this down. God's path to freedom for you is many times clearing the path for freedom for somebody else. God's path of freedom for you might come by clearing the path of freedom for somebody else. I like to say it this way. What you make happen for others, God makes happen for you. We also say here at Journey quite often, you probably heard me say it a million times, that someone's miracle is inside you. And when I read this story, here's what struck out to me. Here's what jumped off the page for me. It's how dependent Elijah and the widow are dependent on each other for their miracle. 
Now we're talking about finding freedom. We'll get there here in a moment. Without Elijah, the widow and her son don't eat. They don't survive and they die. Elijah needed the widow just as much as the widow needed Elijah. Here's something crazy I want to tell you. You need me and I need you. Here's something crazy. The people at Journey need you and you need them. Your neighbor needs you and you need them. Verse 15, and she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he, being Elijah, and her household ate for many days. What shocked me here is this is not a one-time occurrence. This happened, the, the flour didn't run out, the oil didn't run out for days, and they just hung out and had a feast fest. It was like a buffet. God is using this woman to bring miracles to Elijah, and Elijah brought miracles to this woman. But it doesn't stop right there. Look at verse 17. The story continues. After this, the son of the woman uh, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. In other words, he died. And she said to Elijah, why have you against this me, to me, against me, O man of God? You've come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and cause the death of my son. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged. And he laid him on his own bed. And he cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, you have brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn with by killing her son. Then he stretched upon the child three times and cried out, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber to the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord is in your mouth is truth. Why do I share this story with you? We're talking about finding freedom. We're talking about five moves to guarantee a win in 19. Know God. you got to know him. You've got to discover your purpose. Elijah knew his purpose was to hear and obey God. Now Elijah was finding freedom just as much as the widow was finding freedom. You see, I think this story is how we actually find freedom. It's through relationships. This story is a powerful example of the relation, relational needs that we have. Many of us want to be an island. We want God to provide for us through the brook. We want God to provide for us this miracle of the ravens coming to us and providing for us in the morning and the evening. But Elijah was all alone. You know, there are miracles that will come to you that God will do these miracles to you. But if God's going to bring you to a place of freedom and do the supernatural in your life, I believe, he's never going to do it in your life alone. Miracles always happen through people. That's why we say God's miracle, there's a miracle inside you. And that what you make happen for others, God will make, what you happen, make happen for others, God will make happen for you. See, this was messy, wasn't it? The relationship situation was messy. Do you see that the widow said to Elijah to her, when her son was sick, why do you have this against me, O man of God? You've come to bring me my sin to remembrance and cause death of my son. She was hurt. She was angry. She was lashing out at Elijah here who had saved her before, and, and not because she was a bad person, because she was hurt. Sometimes when we're hurt, we wind up hurting people. I want you to think about the chain of events that were, in, were introduced to this widow. She thinks her son and even herself are about to die. She was worried about today. She was preparing for uh, her day to come and she was praying for a miracle. But God was taking care of her daily miracle and even a future miracle. Do you remember the series of events for Elijah? He asked her for food. She says, I have nothing to give. I'm about to die. Elijah says, well, you've got a little something. You, you've got a little something in your hand. You've got a little something in your vessel. You see, God calls you, us a vessel of honor and glory. And you might not think that you have something to give to somebody, but you've got a little something inside you. 
You have a testimony. You have a story. You have encouragement. You have the ability to pray for people. You have something inside your life, even though around you it might appear you have nothing. He said, God has this way of taking what's inside you, and if we bring it to him, he has a way of multiplying it and using it to help other people, and because you help other people, winds up helping us. Now, what happens to that day if you said to Elijah, sorry, I, I can't help you, man. I got my own drama. I, I don't have room in my story for your story. There's no, no room here. I, I, I got to take care of myself, and she went her own way. She would have locked herself out of the miracle that God was trying to do inside of her home. I want you to write this down. Finding freedom means letting the right people in your life. The right people, not just any people, but the right people. I think that's why James said this right here in chapter 5, verse 13. He said, if any of you are suffering, any of you suffering, any of you watching right now or having an issue, some challenges right now, hello, if any of you are suffering, let him pray. If anyone cheerful, let him sing praise. If any of you among you are sick, let him call for the elders, the right people. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And let the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Here's what I read when I read this, what James is saying. Is anyone who's suffering, anyone in need, anyone not walking in freedom, God has called you to do something specific. Open yourself up to somebody else. Don't stay by the brook all by yourself. Don't do it. The enemy loves to keep us isolated, alone. He's saying, go to the city, go to the elders, share your problems with them. Don't just go to anyone. Just don't go to anyone and post it all over social media, your issues. Go to the right people. James goes on to say there that, that there's power that is accessed when God's people get together and pray and help each other out. We find freedom, here it is, in community. We find freedom when we help each other out. We find freedom when we take that little morsel inside of us, what we're trying to use for ourselves. We say, you know what? Instead of me using it for myself, I'm going to use it for someone else. And God says, right there, my power is going to show up. I'm going to multiply it, and there'll be leftover for them and for you. See, freedom happens when you get close to the right people. James goes on to say, verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins one to another, pray for one another, that you might be healed. Can I just be honest with you? I think a lot of people are forgiven because they pray to God. But there's many people who are not free because they don't confess to one another. Look what it says. Confess your sins one to another, pray for one another, that you might be healed. We receive forgiveness from God when we pray to him and ask for forgiveness. But healing comes when we find the right people. Listen to me, not any person, but the right people to say, hey, will you help me? And when you go to them and you bring them into the equation, healing comes to you. How many people are still not healed because they're not in community? They're not in relationships with the right people. What would happen if there's a way to release those things? See, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. Verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. See, that's from the book of James. I'm sure when James referenced the story of Elijah and the drought, he knew that his readers would be thinking about the rest of the story. I think that's why he mentions it right before praying for the sick. I think they knew and remembered what Elijah did for the widow's son. I think they were tied together in James' mind because eventually Elijah prayed again and the rain came. Which, which is what happened at the widow's son was raised from the dead. James is trying to get the people to see God's miraculous often comes through relationships they come uh, often by doing life with one another, sharing one another's burdens. There's actually a verse in the Bible that talks about sharing burdens with one another. My brothers, 
If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings him back is a sinner from his wandering, will save his soul from death, and will cover a multitude of sins. So I think what James is trying to get at here is the story of Elijah is the remedy to suffering as a result of sin or even confessing or the suffering brought by sickness. The remedy is community. The way we're able to walk in freedom is by chaining yourself to the people of God that God brings into your life. You walk arm in arm and hand in hand with those people. See, that's why at Journey, we do journey groups. We gather people together. I will say that the most important thing at Journey is not just our weekend services that we gather together, because that's where we get to know God. And it's not just connect where we actually get to discover your purpose, but the, one of the most important things is that we find freedom and community in Journey groups. You know, right now, you can go to journey.church slash groups. You can do it right now. And you can find a list of so many different groups, something for someone. There's some, a home that's open to you throughout the week that will, will help you take your next step and find freedom. I'll never forget, and you've heard this story, but it bears repeating. About three years ago, I was preaching and sharing about the importance of groups. And, and as I'm preaching, I heard the Holy Spirit say in my mind, uh, yeah, but you're not a group. I had so many fears. I didn't want to join a group because I thought people would judge me. I was worried that people would hear my stuff and, and the areas that I wasn't healed in yet. And maybe they could take it and post it on Facebook or something, right? And I, and I, was, I was complaining to the Lord about those areas. I heard the Lord say to me, it sounds like you have trust issues. But you know what I also had? I had freedom issues. There are areas of my life I wasn't free in. The past, past three years, every other week, on a Tuesday morning at 7 a.m., I get to meet with some great guys who we do life together. I get to share my concerns and my fear. And they actually share the same things. And, and we're not sitting around crying all day. Here's what we're doing. We're doing life together. We go fly fishing together. We, do, we go out to eat together and hang out. Why? It's because it's important to find freedom in community. We believe in the power of community, the power of allowing godly people into your life in seasons of drought, to believe with you the season of drought can turn to a season of abundance. Now listen, I don't know where you're at in your faith walk, and I know you're watching at home, bundled up nice and warm. Maybe God's knocking at the door of your heart and saying, hey, in 19, I want you to win. I want you to be successful, and one of the moves you have to make this year is community. You've got to stop being an island and hanging out by the brook all by yourself. Maybe you feel like it's drying up. It's time to go to the next step, the next move. What is that? A journey group. Find community. Go to journey.church slash groups. Sign up for a group today. Maybe for you, there's not a group in your area. Let's talk to you about starting a group or partnering with someone to start a group. Open your home as a host home. Watch what God will do in you and through you. Here's what I want to do is I want you to close your eyes, bow your head, and I want to uh, ask a very important question as you're gathered together with your family and your friends. Maybe you're far from Jesus and you do not have a relationship with him. And you say, today's my moment. Today's my moment I'm going to give my life to Jesus but I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation. I want you to pray it in your heart. Pray it in your mind. You can even whisper it out loud. Don't be afraid of those around you. After we're done praying, I do want you to let the moderator know that you want to give your life to Christ. We will help you take your next step towards the Lord successfully. Will you pray this prayer with me? Lord, I surrender my life to you. I don't want to do it alone. I need you in my life. I ask for forgiveness of all my sin. And I know now today that you're a forgiving God and you have forgiven me. I receive forgiveness. I'm a child of God this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said amen and amen. Hey, listen, I'm so proud of you if you made that decision. Please don't run off. Let those around the, the computer screen or television, let them know that you prayed that prayer. Let the moderator know. Also, if you're like, hey, I need community, I need to be tethered into a group of people, please 
Go to journey.church slash groups. The moderator will put that link on, on the screen there for you. Uh, finally, let me say this before we end our time together. This, this uh, Wednesday, we have Code Red. Please join us at Code Red. Bring a guest with you, uh, someone who might be far from Jesus, and let's believe God for miracles in their life. And finally, normally at the end of our time together, we always receive our tithe and our offering as an act of worship at the conclusion of our worship time together and our receiving of the word. If you'll take some time to give your tithe and your offerings at journey.church, or if you're watching at, online right now on our website, you can click that give button as well. Or again, like I said, go to journey.church to give. Pastor Jennifer and I love you. We thank God for you. Please stay safe, drive safe, and we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday and next Sunday. God bless you.